welcome back, Trinidad and Tobago. And believe you me, um, you would not like to hear the conversation that takes place when the cameras stop rolling. I, 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 I did promise that we were going to record all the bureaus from all the episodes that we've had so far and consolidate them into one presentation, all right? So, because we, 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 we had some confessions, remember? <laughs> and we had some conversations, right? We had some real heart to heart and stuff, and then we also had some people getting crazy. And there are a couple of you who enjoy getting up as soon as the camera starts rolling to, you know, adjust yourself. It's, yeah. it's very interesting to look at. We, 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 we make a B-roll, we let it go along. <laughs> anyway, we're back, and of course, we, we still have Mr. Shane Mohammed in the chair. Remember, as I said before, it's a marathon session. We've got another episode coming up right after this one has ended. And we're going to, of course, take you all the way till 11 o'clock tonight as we wrap up the last installment of the chair here on STV Real TV. Let's get back to the panel and Mr. Mohammed. Good evening, Mr. Mohammed. Ayana Philip, International Movement for Change. Hi, Ayana. Um, can you please tell us, during your time, or you still are the international relations officer, what are some of the agreements you would have negotiated on an international level? Okay, so I'm international relations at a political level. So therefore, it's not a matter of um, negotiating treaties and arrangements. It's really a matter of building relations with, um, building relations with other countries. Um, I have been able to build a relationship through um, China has this arrangement where um, the government of China, in its attempt to show that there's more to China than just communist China, um, opened up China in, on an invitation for Caribbean countries that have governments of Caribbean, of leading parties of leading Caribbean countries. So when I went to China, it was my uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and Antigua and Barbuda. And we were able to, one, um, make connection with the CPC in China and see what they're about. And it, you know, when you hear about communist China, you think into one particular direction. What I admire, for, um, admire them for is their political structure that they've been able to maintain. Um, and they, 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 they teach you the institutional knowledge of their, of their, of their, of their party and their history. Um, I've been able to maintain relations with the JLP in Jamaica. Um, I have friends in Jamaica who I have been able to maintain relations with. Um, we have uh, we have I've been able to meet with uh, the ambassador from Ecuador and Ecuador has been able to come to Trinidad and Tobago and meet with us and indicate they have an interest. Now Ecuador is just like it's just like uh, China where the ruling party it's one it's one party and they, they, they come on a both a government and a political level so they want to one maintain relations with us as a government and two they want to maintain relations with the party and prior to that uh, when I first became international relations officer um, I met with the ambassador from Mexico um, to learn about their political history and their political structure and oh. what exactly has come out of it like how has it benefited the country it will not benefit far? the country per se it's so then why have these um, international relations, relations with, because it, it's about building us. relations between political parties and there are things that one political party will be able to learn from another of how they conduct their business how they do their structuring okay, and so that kind what of thing. has the united national congress learned from all these well different... one of the things that we've been able to learn is when i went to china they took us to their college, a college, a university that is built on party structure. And they teach you from, from the bottom up in China, you start at the lowest level and your years in, in, in the party builds you up. So that the person who is now the political, the leader of the Chinese um, political party and who is the, prime, the president, he would have started at the grassroots level, at the party school level. And it shows you how important it is to teach your um, your incoming um, generations about one party structure, political history, and the history of your country so that they would learn and know how to move forward. Okay, okay. Um. Hi, good evening. Hi. I'm um, Brandon O'Brien, Team Brandon. TT. Um, you work in communications in the Ministry of Health, correct? I do. Um, so I'm trying to be brief because we have sure. very um, limited time. Um, my first question in that arena is um, when Dr. Khan was here um, some episodes back, I had asked a question about um, blood donation bans for LGBT persons, that LGBT persons are disallowed from um, donating blood. I want to know whether or not you could um, clarify his position 
um, on that matter for me. And my second question, um, separate from that, is in the constituency of Princess Town, they have two candidates, um, um, Nikolaisky Ali from the PNM and the UNC candidate Barry Padarat, um, both of which on social media have been getting like special kinds of, of denigration and hate from within their own party bases uh, about their assumed identity. And that, to me, uh, is a, a very clear example of the kinds of of abuse and discrimination that LGBT um, persons face in Trinidad and Tobago because these people are assumed to be gay and as a result uh, dealing with this kind of discrimination. I want to know if I could hear from you personally, what do you think on those things? Okay, first of all, um, I saw Dr. Khan's interview and I, 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 re I found out um, by through giving blood that there are certain restrictions on those persons who can give blood. Um, one of that is persons who are who is LGBT, and the other is persons who have who have gone to specific countries in the world. And if you, one of them was when I had visited China, I, I had volunteered to give blood, and because I had gone to China three months before, they said no, I did not qualify because there are certain countries that have been blacklisted because of uh, high levels of viruses that come out of there. Um, I want to be sure, by the way, that on the country list, those are deferrals, meaning yes. that you can, you can donate after, after a while, yes, but yes. LGBT persons a have a lifetime. A yeah. Um, Even though there are countries where that right. is not the case. And I know Dr. Khan said, in his, in, and I would take it from his perspective, um, Dr. Khan said that there are, you are more likely to get uh, HIV or an a STD from somebody who might be straight rather than somebody who is LGBT. Um, I cannot, I don't know. I will say to you, I don't know what is the reason. I don't know whether it's regulatory in Trinidad and Tobago or law. I don't think it's law. I think it's more regulatory because of the high prevalence from the previous time during the 80s when it was high that HIV came from more persons who were LGBT. Um, to your second question, um, the world is evolving. And in an evolving world, cultures and traditions and morals don't evolve. And we have discipline, production, and tolerance as our key watchwords in Trinidad and Tobago. And as many people may not like him, but Satmaraj said the other day that he thinks one of it should be acceptance, okay? And I, I, it made me think when he said it that acceptance is one of the things that we should be able to do. LGBT in Trinidad and Tobago is going to be a long-winded road. Why? I want LG, and this is my advice to LGBT people, that first, you can't just simply say, we want rights. We have to understand that in Trinidad and Tobago, there is the Sexual Offenses Act that, pre that, that prevents people of the same sex from having sexual intercourse. And there's the Immigration Act, which thank God prevents them from entering, which thank God it's not implemented as strictly as the law is. I have to correct myself. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm going to, yeah, because I want to be very clear, because I've heard everybody come on the show and you've asked the same question, and I don't think anybody's taken the time to explain it in a philosophical way that I, maybe, because I've been asked these questions by an international magazine before, because someone from, from Atlanta came to Trinidad and was very shocked that this is what was happening. So you have two aspects, immigration and sexual offenses. One, you can't just simply come one day and say, I am LGBT, I am part of CAISO, that I want rights. You must be able to specify which your what um, rights. To be clear, CAISO and other organizations that form a group called the Allies for Justice and Diversity have created a 10-point platform for, 12-point platform okay. for the so um, not policy changes I'm that. Not, okay. Yeah, boy, I'm, it's serious. I've not seen it's it. It's serious. But okay. So, Among them is a moratorium on the um, Sexual Offenses Act, um, adjustments to the Children's, okay. uh, the Children's Act, and so on. I'll tell you this. W my advice to everybody who is advocating for it is that the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, and the political culture in particular, and particularly me political mentality, is aggression will y yield you very little results. Okay? That's the first thing. The minute you hear or see a protest in someone's mind who is in power, 
or who is in government or who is in power generally, you see a protest and you think automatically opposition, right? I would advise, get the groups together. Get the religious leaders together. Because whether we like it or not, religious leaders in Trinidad and Tobago play a very critical and important role. They first must understand, and because we live in a cosmopolitan country, my friend, it's going to be even harder. Because it's going to be very difficult for you to get the Muslims to sit on the same page as the Christians and the Hindus and the, and the Baha'is and the Buddhists. What you have to do is come not all the way through, but meet at a middle ground. In your 12-point plan, start dealing it in steps. Step one, your three top issues that you have you want addressed. Your second plan, step, your other, and you go down like that. That's the only way that we will be able to get leaders, the mature society, the persons who are traditionalists, the persons who are bent on their traditions because of moral and spiritual backgrounds, that's the only way you're going to get them to understand. If we as young people want to bring change in that particular sphere, nothing is wrong with it, but we must be tactful, we must be understanding to what is around us as young people and what the greater society is thinking. Yeah, I do want to cut you off, right, Shane, but I want to, I think it's important to go back to how this how this whole thing really began, and that is there are two candidates for the same constituency, Princess Town, this the constituency that you um, screened for. One of them from your party, who um, from multiple constituents, including their own base. In this case, Barry Padarat's own UNC base, uh, is turning against him because of his perceived sexual orientation, and your response to systemic and actual discrimination in constituencies and the wider nation uh, is to bring people together and attempt to have a conversation when people are being actively discriminated okay. against, even in their attempt to serve their constituents okay. and their nation. So let me, let me zero into that specific thing, right? <clears throat> I think it's very, we have a very special scenario here where, and, I, and I, I must commend you for saying the perception, because I know Dr. Khan came on and he said, that you can't identify someone at all, right? So the perception, okay? And what I think Trinidad and Tobago needs to move beyond is that these two individuals have put themselves up for national service to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, whether they are in opposition or in government. And the very fact that whether they are or are not what they are perceived to be, they've taken the chance knowing how cruel our society can be, right? They've taken that chance to put themselves up is one, a step forward. Two, I think the Trinidad and Tobago people need to understand that we must first, and that is one of the reasons why there's lawlessness and there's, there, there's a level of disgust when it comes to lawlessness. We must first have respect. We must respect each other. We must respect those two young men we must first respect them as individuals, secondly, respect them as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and thirdly, respect them as persons who put themselves up for national service and to a great lesser extent, but by extension, national ridicule. And they must be commended for that, right? One, I don't agree with the stance that people have taken from my own political party. If they are accusing and they are denigrating, we cannot move forward as a country and as young people, as a nation, unless we learn to respect people for who they are, whether they are what you perceive them to be or not. That's the first thing. We must give, understand that these people have courage. It's not easy to sit in the chair. It is not easy to be in national service. It is not easy to be in public face. I said to a friend of mine the other day, I would appreciate if people stop staring at me and just say hello. Because they look at you, they, oh, I know that face, right? But it's not an easy job. Public service, is not an easy job. Being Keith Rowley and Jack Warner and Kamala Posad Bissessa is not an easy job. More so to be the Prime Minister of the country, more so to be a woman, more so to be in a situation where your, your leader might be, what about if your leader was a gay man or woman, right? You have those accusations, and those accusations come from a level of small-mindedness that we as a people must be able to overcome in the 21st century. And until that day, we are not going anywhere. Okay. Until that day comes, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. And that's my stance on that.
No, I, 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 I had to let the conversation flow. We've actually gone uh, more than nine minutes over the, the scheduled time for this particular edition of the program, but it was so necessary because when we conceived the idea of doing the chair, this, ladies and gentlemen, is what it was all about. And we got a real refined process coming out this evening. Shane Mohammed, thank you very much. As one of the youngest people in the chair, um, and uh, the, 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 the one that really had a, 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 a true conversation. When I, when I sit in this room and I look, I can say, okay, we may have the next uh, prime minister sitting in the. In the I, I, thank you very much. We may, we, we may have we may have we may have the next attorney general. We very may much have the so. next president and first lady. We may have uh, the next senator sitting here um, or future senator sitting here here, here uh, uh, as part of our panel this evening. All right, and that 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 in itself that in itself says something. Okay, we had a chance to have a real direct conversation. It was. It was really pure and upfront, and that LBGT question has been circulating throughout every episode. And uh, Brandon and, and Brandon made it their business to keep it alive. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm impressed about the fact that they start to be started the conversation here at, at STV, and then I saw it transmute onto social media and become a topic of discussion. Move to conventional media where we had uh, journalists asking the questions of uh, the opposition leader, the prime minister, and everyone else. So it, 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 it meant that in some small way we were able to influence the conversation. And that also is something that I think you all should commend yourselves for because you're able to do that, right? Notwithstanding that, we do remember that after our very first guest who was part of a particular, a particular party, after the conversation and the, uh, and the execution of the chair the very next day, there seemed to have been a dismantling of that old position and walking away from the party. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> anyway, anyway we, we've, got, we've got to do the needful and we've got to wrap up this edition. So we've got to thank Shane very much for all the support and uh, uh, thank you for your contribution this evening. And I'm looking forward to the rest of your political life. Thank you very um, much. With, with excitement, all right? Um, uh, to the panel, we, we, we still have some more to come. We've got our second edition to go. So we got to thank Mr. Mohammed. I did, of course, present some surprise and refreshments for you guys while we take a quick break and we come back uh, with the second round of, um, of our presentation this evening. So again, the chair continues as we go into the marathon. We're going all the way till 11 o'clock. We thank our guest, Shane Mohammed, And we're coming back in a while with more. All right, this is another commercial break. This is the wrap up of this edition. We start another a new show when we come back. All right? Rise up, fall in Rise and take your stands again. And run away. We live to fight another day. It's politics time again.